Muslims today are looking for heroes. They're looking at comic books. They're looking at Western presidents and prime ministers and kings to be their heroes. What happened to our real heroes? The German king, Willem II, said, I've met many monarchs and rulers in my life and I found them all to be my inferiors, or at best, my equals. But when I entered the presence of Abdul Hamid, I began to tremble. He is such a hero, the most important hero in the last hundred years that we must remember, who stood up against the whole world for 33 years alone, defending the rights of every Muslim from east to west to north and south. Cherkis people were really fascinating. They come into the Ottoman domains and quickly become part of the Ottoman administration. And Sultan Abdul Hamid's mother was Cherkis. She died when he was 11. And then his stepmother, who couldn't have children, was also Cherkis. And she took good care of him. They gave him most of his education. And it's an interesting story. When Abdul Hamid was young, he wasn't a religious kid. He was an older kid. He became religious as he got older. A Sultan uh, Abdul Hamid has من صفات الهدوء التام وكان قد ورثه عن زوج أبيه فأبوه بعد وفاة أمه تزوج امرأة هذه المرأة توفي توفيت أم السلطان الحميد وعمره 11 سنة فرعته زوج أبيه رعاية بالغة وحنت عليه فأحب حبا جما حتى أنه عندما تولى السلطنة سماها بالسلطانة لم يجعل زوجه هي سلطانة كما جرت العادة جعل زوج أمه هي سلطانة لكنه قال لها بكل حزم قال لها يا أمه أنت الآن سلطانة لكن لا أسمح لك أبدا بحزم وبقوة بتدخل في شؤون القصر بأي حال من الأحوال So 1876 is the year of the three sultans. What this means is that Sultan Abdulaziz, who was the uncle of Sultan Abdul Hamid, was deposed, he was removed from power. And the reason why he was removed from power is because they wanted a constitutional caliphate. There's a unique idea of having a Khilafah system which is constitutional. And he wanted a parliament. Well, they wanted a parliament, right? And so what they did is initially they removed Abdulaziz from power and they brought Murad in power to be the constitutional caliph. Legend has it that Abdul Aziz killed himself um, after being deposed, but it's very unlikely he did that. And the reason being is because both his wrists were slit. So the chances are is that he was probably murdered because he was resisting the idea of having a constitutional caliphate because he wanted to be the absolute sultan. That's where the challenge was. How do we have a system where we could remove the caliph from power? And so what they wanted was a document, a constitution of explaining to society what the role and job of the Khalifa was in relation to society and in relation to the Sharia. That's what they were trying to institutionalize. To have a constitution, the constitutional caliphate underneath, and then the Khalifa is important. Now, this became very controversial because people said in the Quran, it says, obey Allah and obey the messenger and those in authority from amongst you. How can you get a caliph and put him under a constitution? How is that even possible? So that's the system they wanted. They got it. And then they have a situation because they say society is not ready for it. People are not ready for it. The opinion of the public mattered for the first time. It, it did matter in the past, but they had people, representatives for them that were sufficient to safeguard their interest. Now, with newspapers and so forth, there's a closer bond between those who are governing and those who are being governed. But in fact, what you're seeing is, you know, the zeitgeist at the time is everything is changing very quickly. The world is getting smaller and they're trying to centralize. Abdulaziz is dead, Murad comes into power, and then what happens is Murad goes crazy, loses his mind. And so then they choose Abdul Hamid II. The academics at the time said that Abdul Hamid was anti-constitution. That's not necessarily true. When we look at the information, Abdul Hamid didn't actually have a problem with the constitution. He just felt that people were not ready. And so there was a difference in opinion. 
One of the biggest problems they had was the role of non-Muslims in the Ottoman parliament. Can we have non-Muslims in the Ottoman parliament or not? The parliament became like a, a council and should non-Muslims have the same weight of opinion as, non -Muslims, as Muslims? It became a contentious issue at this moment. Some ulama said no, non-Muslims cannot be in the Ottoman parliament and other ulama said they can be, it's not a problem. Some ulama went as far as saying that non-Muslims could be Grand Vizier but we won't let that happen because it's a Muslim entity. Now that might sound outrageous to some people, but understand how the, the domains is. It's a multi-ethnic domain. Bosnia, to Cairo, to Yemen, to Anatolia. It's huge. And there are many non-Muslims. And the argument that was made is that we should hear the opinions of non-Muslims regarding their communities, and we should hear the opinions of non-Muslims regarding what opinions and ideas they can give because they are also loyal to where they live. But the Khalifa had to be Muslim, obviously. Sheikh al-Islam had to be Muslim. And the, the commander of the army had to be Muslim. The Grand Vizier could have been non-Muslim, but they said, we're not going to let that happen. So they opened the parliament. They go to war with Russia. And Abdul Hamid says, this parliament created chaos. It did nothing but create chaos for me. I couldn't make decisions. And what you see is now two decision-making processes. The first decision-making process, the idea is that one strong leader the buck stops with that person and they make all the decision. The second idea is to have a parliament and there's more decision makers in the parliament. Which system works? The ulama came to the conclusion both of them are possible. So now you start to see a shift taking place in history, backwards and forwards in terms of what type of political system they want. 78, Abdul Hamid says goodbye. I'm out. I'm done with this. And so the constitutional experiment, it's gone. Now, what Abdul Hamid focused on when he came into power then is what they call in the West, pan-Islamism, which actually the word we use is ittihad islam A better translation, if we were going to use a translation, is Islamic unity or Muslim unity. But pan-Islamism became a loaded term, political Islam. And Abdul Hamid is using pan-Islamic policies. So ittihad, unity, is what Abdul Hamid called for. And so his policy is now focused on a physical manifestation of Islam that can be seen within the Ottoman domains. Abdul Hamid had an interesting problem because he lost a lot of the Balkans. And so he, the only thing that was left was Turkey and the Arab provinces. What he did is he had this situation of Ummah. How does the Ummah work? You have Ummah in the domains, you have Ummah outside of the domains, and you have Ummah that have lands that have just been lost. What do I do now? So what you see in this period is even the idea of Ummah starts to become complicated in the minds of the Ottomans. Does Abdul Hamid as a caliph have any jurisdiction, any authority over Muslims outside of the domains? Can he help Muslims outside the domains? And what should his help be? The interesting question is, is what is the requirements for Muslims outside? So Muslims in India, what can they ask for? What can they ask for from the caliph who they don't live under? Can they say, give us A, B, C, D? And if he doesn't give it, is he a bad caliph? So Muslims in India were colonized by the British. They wanted Abdul Hamid to send an army to take them out. He says, I can't do that. My army's first lot strong enough, the domains is really big, and I have to get through Iran. How's this gonna work? But I can send you money. Now here, what happens is Muslims today become very, they start using today's morality to judge that past. Now that, that was unacceptable. Why couldn't he do that? But here's the complexity. The domains are moving, and he has to make a sense of what it means. كان ايضا ومن العجائب انه في الصين قد افتتح معهدا حمي يسمى المعهد الاسلامي الحميدي نسبه اليه في الصين ولما افتتح ذلك المعهد وجاء الصينيون ليحتفلوا بكوا من ما ما لانهم كانوا يجتمعون في قلوبهم مع السلطان العثماني والخليفه العثماني كان خليفه عاما للمسلمين وكانت قلوب المسلمين معه تحبه وتؤيده وتشد من ازره اذا الجامعه الاسلاميه كانت هاجسا كبيرا عنده وكان يرسل المشايخ الإسلام وعلماء المسلمين إلى الأكراد ليهدئهم ويسكن من ثائرتهم باسم الإسلام وكان يعمل شيء نفسه في في ولايات الدولة العثمانية العربية وغير العربية وكان يقرب إليه مشايخ وعلماء من الدول العربية وغيرها كل ذلك يريد ما يسمى بالجامعة الإسلامية وكان يقول إن القوة الحقيقية للدولة العثمانية تكمن في الجامعة الإسلامية وأنه بالإسلام يجتمع المسلمون وسيكونون يوما ما قوة 
تضرب رقاب الكفار وتطردهم من بلادها يعني كان دائما يحلم بهذه الجامعة الإسلامية في وقت كانت القوميات قد انتشرت في الدولة العثمانية انتشارا في الحقيقة انتشارا هائلا جدا Internally, the first thing he does is new educational policies. Abdul Hamid felt that the madrasa was not sufficient to give an education to Muslims who wanted to study other subjects apart from ulum al-din. Whereas in the past, the madrasa was sufficient to teach you math, science, and so forth. By the 19th century, engineering, translation, these sort of subjects became very difficult for the madrasa to deal with. The madrasa is also going through a flux. So you have one policy, build new schools, reform the madrasa, or keep the madrasa and build new schools next to it. He couldn't trash the madrasa, obviously, he was never going to do that. He couldn't reform the madrasa, because if he reformed the madrasa, many conservative ulama were saying, what are you doing? Don't touch it. It's got nothing to do with you. The state was not paying for the madrasas. It was paid by society, communities, and so forth. Because the argument is, is that the madrasa should always be independent from power. Because if it's not, power can manipulate the madrasa. People keep asking the question, well, where, why didn't the Ottomans tax people? to raise the money. Why did they take loans from the West? The reason why they couldn't tax people because the ulama said you can't tax people like that. It's unfair. So where are they getting the money from? They can't tax people because people will complain that we're Muslim or non-Muslims. Why are you taxing us so high? What are you taxing us on? Where are you getting the money from? The zakat was not sufficient. And so now they're in a bit of a bind. We need to reform our military. We need to do that. But how do we do that? Can I السلطان عبد الحميد قد تولى وتركت الدولة ثقيلة إلى الغاية وورث هذه المسألة ورث ديونا هائلة تقدر ب 52 و 200 مليون ليرة عثمانية ذهبا وهي اليوم تقدر بمئات البلايين من الجنيهات الاسترلينية مبلغ ضخم جدا من الديون استطاع عبد الحميد بدهائه وذكائه وعدم اسرافه وكانت صفه واضحه فيه استطاع ان يخفض هذه الديون الى العشر تقريبا لتكون 30 مليون ليره ذهبيه عثمانيه عندما قام الانقلاب عليه بعد اكثر من 30 سنه. Understand that when the West were creating their new technological tools, they were doing it with the help of colonialism. They go places, take stuff, make money, build. But the Ottomans couldn't do that. So when the British built trains, they didn't build trains because they wanted to move people so they could have a wonderful journey in India. They were moving soldiers, they were moving resources. That was their mindset. That's why we will build trains, move it faster. When you're building new weapons, the reason why you're building weapons is to take out people quicker. So they started building new weapons. The Ottomans didn't have that mindset because that's not how they saw the world. The main crux in the Ottoman Empire at the time was the idea of justice. They weren't thinking of colonizing people. They were thinking of justice. How do you compete now with empires that are colonizing and using extreme violence? How do you adjust your policies? So the policy is, okay, we can take this from the West, but what do we do to it? Can we Islamize it? What type of education can we give the young Muslim community or societies to the one hand that can compete with the West, but at the same time not attack our Islamic educational system? Abdul Hamid's main idea was to give you a basic education and insist on morality, ethics and morality. Make sure all the Muslim students have good morals and values. Loyal to Islam, loyal to the Sultan, loyal to your teacher, and then loyal to your parents. And we can see in the 19th century, it mattered to the Ottomans. So Abdul Hamid's idea was education. The Hijaz railway station is the project that Abdul Hamid um, believes in, which is the, the project for the pilgrims, which is to have a railway station that starts in Istanbul and goes all the way down to Makkah and Medina and actually stretch to Sana'a uh, in, in, in Yemen. And the idea is fundamentally for the pilgrims. That's the idea. So it's very different from what the, what the British are doing in India. They're building infrastructure to be able to allow pilgrims to move up and down because trains, steamships, telegram, a newspaper, these were new forms of technology that were allowing access of information and, and movement to happen a lot faster. Abdul Hamid unfortunately didn't get to see um, the actual Hijaz railway station take off in that sense because the revolution happens and so forth. But it's a project he invested in heavily. The Germans did it because once again they had the tech and uh, the machinery uh, to do it and they built uh, the railway station 
and they had trains already in other parts of the Ottoman domains. So they had a railway that was going to Baghdad, and they built a railway that goes into the Balkans. So this is not the only train service that they, are, they provide in, but it is fundamentally for the pilgrims. And in World War I, it's used to be able to move the soldiers from up to down. And so Lawrence recognizes this, and he blows up the railway station to make sure it doesn't happen. It's a shame, because now people are imagining the possibility of having a railway from Istanbul to the Arab world again. And he worked, he worked to wake up the spirit of Islam again. He was sending aid and help to the Muslims in Africa, in India, in Indonesia, everywhere to wake them up and bring the body of the Muslims together. He even started to spread Islam into Japan. The Emperor Meiji sent a letter to Sultan Abdul Hamid Khan saying, I'm asking you to send us scholars to teach us Islam which can build a moral relationship between you and us. He was sending help to the Christians where their own kings and their own queens were forsaking them. He built the Hijazi railway to connect the whole Muslim world to Mecca and Medina. He reduced the debts of the empire by more than 90%. He kept Quds Sharif in the hands of the Muslims he was the Khalifa in maybe the hardest times that the Ummah had ever seen. He was writing poems asking for help from Allah, saying, My Allah, I know you are the Aziz. There is no Aziz but you. You are the one, nothing else. My Allah, take my hand in these hard times. My Allah, be my helper in this dangerous hour. He was a man that when the people of the East and the West saw him, their heads bowed down in respect. He inspired fear in the enemies of Islam with his haybat. In France, they wrote a play to insult the Holy Prophet ﷺ. When this was informed to Sultan Abdul Hamid Khan, he told the French, if you put on this play, I will declare war on you. From the seat of the Hilafat on behalf of the entire Alam al-Islam. The Prime Minister of France himself stepped in and stopped the play from being performed. Fezzes were really interesting because one of the things you see in the Ottoman period is what we call uh, clothing reform. Clothing in that time was a type of uniform. In the Ottoman context in the 19th century globally, uniform was a marker of identity. When the Turkish Republic was formed and people were making the ulama take off their hats and so forth, it became really problematic because one of the ulama said, first you take off our clothes, then you take off what's in our minds. You can't see a single photo in this period with a man without a hat. Everybody's got their head covered. When they tried to change the, the turban to the fez, it was also controversial. But they justified it by saying this came from Morocco. So in Turkey, they call Morocco fez. Okay, so it came from there. They said, we can do with this. It's okay. This is Islamic. But in World War I, the fez became problematic because the Western soldiers could see these red hats and just pop, pop, pop, pop them off. So you can see clothing, how it worked and operates in that sense as well. So there's a, there's a to and fro to everything. In this period, the Muslims were really concerned about women's clothing, actually. And there was a piece by Mehmet al Akif, who wrote the Turkish National Anthem, and he's talking about Islamic civilization, Medinia. And this random paragraph comes in about women's clothing. And he was, they were complaining that, it was really fascinating, that the women are showing their wrists. So they were annoyed that the women were showing their wrists, actually, in this context. They just felt that more and more women were starting to become a lot more flagrant in their um, clothing choices. When Abdul Hamid did the education, there was education for women too. وكان يقاوم التفسخ الغربي الوارد إلى بلاده حتى أنه عندما بدأ يلاحظه سلطان بدأ يلاحظ أن بعض النساء تخلينا عن اللباس العثماني وصرنا يلبسنا اللباس الأوروبي تخلينا عن اللبس العثماني الجميل والتي تغطي فيه المرأة وجهها يشمك هذا المشهور العثماني فأصدر مرسوما إلى الحكومة ليعلقوه في الشوارع وينشروه في الصحف أنه ليس لامرأة أن تسير في الطريق بدون أن تغطي وجهها بالنقاب العثماني المعروف وعلى النقاب ألا يكون شفافا يبرز الوجه بل عليه أن على على المرأة أن تلبس نقابا يخفي محاسن وجهها ويكون كما هو الحال في اللباس العثماني المشهور 
وجعل امرا الى الحكومه والى الشرطه when photographs came into the muslim world at this time they created what you would call memories for you photographs are really powerful it was really intri intriguing how in the ottoman domains now they were using photographs to construct the memory for you. this is what quds looks like this is what baghdad looks like this is what india looks like Abdul Hamid was very fast, interesting in the way he used photographs. Photographs of himself removed it. He didn't want people to worship him. What he did is he put this up. But this symbol became far more powerful than a photograph in itself. It's a very unique way of creating an imagination of people. People never saw you, but they saw your signature stamped in the wall. You walk down the street of Damascus, there's a fountain, stamp. And so you had an image of the Sultan, but you didn't see the Sultan. It's very unique what he did. He tried to control the symbols that represent him. One of the unique things about Abdul Hamid, he understood symbolism. They have a saying in Turkey, which is Devlet Chalishur, meaning the state is working because you can always see something is being built. So you can't see the Sultan, but you can see a hospital was built. Yes, the, the dollar is working. There's a mosque here. Yes, they're working. That's sufficient for us. And Abdul Hamid was good at that. There were those who were sitting next to him and they were pretending to be his advisors but they were against him and they were plotting against him but he had the intelligence of a believer and he was looking with the nur of Allah and he saw through their plots. 1909, we have a revolution. When the revolution happened, a lot of people argued that this revolution was inspired by the French Revolution and so westernization is happening again. These people were students from these civil schools. So the very people that Abdul Hamid educated are the people that did a revolution against him. Why? It wasn't that Abdul Hamid was a bad sultan. Abdul Hamid was in power for 33 years. People got exhausted. This is a young generation that are seeing that while Abdul Hamid had maintained the Ottoman domains really well, but what was happening was they felt it was remaining static. It wasn't going beyond that. It wasn't moving. Mustafa Sabri said something really unique. He said, when the revolution in 1908 happened, he said, a revolution is what happens from the people. When the Turkish Republic revolution happened, he says, you can't call that a revolution because that happened from the state. And when revolutions happened, it was really unique because they used the word inkilab. Now, when people heard this, they said, what does inkilab mean? Inkilab was a word invented by the Ottomans themselves. Prior to that, you don't see it much in Arabic literature. The word they used was Thora. What's unique about here, what you see in the Ottoman period, is that revolutions are the extreme form of negotiation with the government itself. There's people who are not being heard, they go to the street. And the ulama justified it. And they justified it against the Khalifa. And Mustafa Sabri was one of them. It's interesting because they're afraid to give Abdul Hamid the, the fatwa. So the Muslims actually don't go to Abdul Hamid to give the fatwa. It's a couple of non-Muslims who turn up and say, you're out. And Abdul Hamid goes, what are you talking about? He says, here's a fatwa, time for you to go. Abdul Hamid capitulated. He didn't use violence on them. He didn't use aggression on them. He said, fine. He checked and he said, how many people? What's the percentage that is uprising? So Sultan Abdul Hamid Khan looked and he checked. He checked those nations that were under his ruling and he saw that they were uprising. Against what? They said, we want to be free. He saw that these are the nations, this is how much percentage, percentage there are in each nation uprising. And Sultan Abdul Hamid Khan sat, he sat and he waited. He said to his people, don't do anything. The general said to him, oh Sultan, we have a big power, we have a big army, we can crush them down. He said, no, all these soldiers who are with me, if one dies in this way, then I will be very sorry in the judgment day. They didn't use the army. He let them uprise. They took him, they sent him to exile. If he had wanted, he could have captured those people coming to him, but he knew. So he didn't object. He said, okay, if people don't want me, I leave. I leave it to the people. They captured Sultan Abdul Hamid, who was such a Sultan that he is a symbol of justice. They made him get on a train in Istanbul. They took him to Salonika to insult him. When he got off the train, the cursed ones there came and called him Corporal Hamid. The Sultan took out his handkerchief and he ripped it apart and said, May Allah make you like this.
This is an interesting picture because this is a picture that shows that this was a delegation that tried to remove Sultan Abdul Hamid from power. Actually, this photograph is a fake. There's Abdul Hamid with his hands in his pocket like this. Abdul Hamid never put his hands in his pocket. Never put his hands in his pocket. So these images, these photographs, these paintings were constructing an idea in the minds of people of what we did and how we removed the Sultan. There are um, enough information that Abdul Hamid was worried because he was concerned that he would be killed. Because one of the problems they had is if a Sultan still remained in existence and there was another Sultan, there would be an army that could be supportive of him that could come back. But here, Abdul Hamid wasn't killed, actually. They sent him to Salonika instead, out of Istanbul, so that he couldn't gather an army um, to start off what they would call a counter-revolution. And Abdul Hamid was really concerned about World War I when they asked him about how could we have got out of World War I. He said, if, firstly, we should never have got involved in World War I. But he said, if we were to get involved in World War I, you should have stayed on the side of the British, the British never lose. When he passes away, it's really fascinating. The people that deposed him from power felt so guilty that they were part of the procession. Some of them even held his coffin. يقول أنور باشا وهو أحد كبار القواد العثمانيين يقول لي جمال باشا صفاح المشهور في دمشق لقد كنا أغبياء يا جمال حينما قمنا بالثورة على السلطان لقد كنا ألعوبة في أيدي الصهيونية العالمية هذا اعتراف ضخم من أنور باشا لجمال باشا وسلطان الحميد في الحقيقة مدحه وناس كثيرون جدا من ساسة أوروبا مثال السياسي الألماني الداهية بسمارك ومثال الرئيس الوزراء البريطاني المشهور ذي الأصل اليهودي الإسرائيلي ومثال عدد كبير جدا من المؤرخين والساسة الغربيين والشرقيين على السواء وعدد كبير من العرب ومن العثمانيين مدحوه مدحا بالغا خاصة عندما تبينت لهم الحقائق بعد ذلك أن هناك رجلا اسمه رضا توفيق كان شاعرا وكان اتحاديا كما سيأتي تفسير اتحادية وكان ماسونيا من كبار الماسونيين وهو ممن سعى طويلا في عز سلطان عبد الحميد هذا رضا توفيق كان شاعرا لما توفي عبد الحميد ماذا قال بعد أن وجد ما وجد من هزام الدولة وتفتيتها وتقطيع أوصالها قال عندما يذكرك التاريخ يا أيها السلطان يكون الحق دائما ومع دائما في جانبك ومعك أيها السلطان العظيم Neredesin Şevketlim Sultan Abdülhamid Han? Feryadım var mı badigahıma? Ölüm uykusundan bilahsa uyan, şundan kör milletin bak günahıma. Tarihler ismini andığı zaman sana hak verecek ey koca sultan. Bizdi bu tammadan iftira atan asrın en siyasi padişahına. Padişah hem zalim hem deli dedik. İhtilale kıyam etmeli dedik, şeytan ne dediyse biz deli dedik, çalıştık fitnenin intibahına. Divane sen değil meğer bizmişiz, bir çürük ipliğe hülya dizmişiz, sadece deli değil edepsizmişiz, tükürdük atalar kıblegahına.